This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. So, uh, members, we are then in um, public session and the cameras and microphones are broadcasting us through uh, the web page and throughout the building. So, I just advise those members and any of the other staff that are here and those in the public gallery that the use of mobile devices, if we could keep them on airplane mode so that they don't interrupt with the, um, the microphones. And also that we're not taking photographs or recording any element of the meeting. Um, committee membership is listed on page 27 of your um, packs, and I'm just that's listed for us, but we can all see each other. But um, that's there for you to note. And on page 28, then I refer members to the declaration of interests, and just to advise members that. All Assembly members are required to register relevant financial and other interests uh, in the Register of Members' Interests, and details of that registered interest are published on the website. So I would remind members that in addition to the requirement, and unfortunately I do have to, in some parts of today's meeting, just to read out things to you, that uh, Standing Order 69.5 states that a member who has a, a financial interest in any matter, or b, a relevant interest in any matter, must declare that interest before taking part in any proceedings of the Assembly relating to that member. In particular, there is a requirement to declare any interest which might reasonably be thought by others to influence the member's approach to the matter that's under consideration. Um, so, also to advise you that uh, proceedings of the Assembly include, include this committee. So, if you have any conflicts of interest, to declare them, and also any interest to make sure that they're declared as well. Um, also, with it being the first meeting of the committee, members should ensure that any financial or other interests which relate to the remit of the committee or which are likely to be relevant to a substantial part of its work are drawn to the attention of the committee. And also, just to inform members that failure to register or declare an interest may be an offence under Section 43 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998. So, at that point, then. Um, after scouring us, just to ask, does any member have any interest that they need to declare for today? Okay. Um, just then to can remind members that rules governing to the registration and declaration of interest are contained in the Code of Conduct and Guide to the Rules relating to the conduct of members, and that if anybody needs any further assistance or clarification on that, they can receive it from the Clerk of Standards. Um, item six, then, is committee procedures. So if I could ask you just to note the following papers that are contained in your pack, which is the Guide to the Powers and Operations of a Statutory Committee for Chairperson and Member, uh, members on page 32. There is the Guide to the Role that I will undertake as Chairperson, which is on page 43. And there is a Guide for Members in the Role and Function of the Committee Office that will provide the help and support, which is available on page 50. Now, I know you have all had a chance to read through that, so are there any questions that anybody...? I presume um, page 32, number 6 has changed to 9 as opposed to 11. It will have, yes. 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 Yeah. Just for... Yes. Thank you. Well spotted. Um, I, I could draw members' attention in particular to the guidance on privilege and matters of sub that are there. Um, again, just something else that needs to be read in. Um, under Section 50 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, for the purposes of the law of defamation, absolute privilege applies equally to the making of a statement in proceedings of the Assembly and the publication of a statement under the Assembly's authority. This privilege also extends to meetings of the committee, so members should note, however, the privilege does not extend to press conferences or statements made to the press. So committee members should be aware of the potential problems associated with discussing a matter that is sub judice, that is a matter which is being or is about to be considered by a court. Um, the sub judice rule required by section 41 and se schedule 6 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 is contained in Standing Order 73. It provides that any matters in relation of which legal proceedings are active should not be referred to in committee proceedings except to the extent permitted by the committee chairperson. 
In such cases, the matter awaiting adjudication should not be prejudiced by comment in a public session of a committee meeting. Um, so there's a fair bit of information in there. Is any any questions to that? Are we all happy? Okay. Uh, and just that the rules relating to, uh, to this are summarised in the Guide to the Power and Operation of Statutory Committees for Chairpersons and Members have been provided with that. Um, item 7, Guidance on the Timescale for Interaction between Committees and Departments. So there is a guidance paper at page 53 which sets out the timescales for the provision of information and evidence between the departments and the committees and was agreed by the Executive and Assembly Chairpersons Liaison Group. So um, the 2011-2016 Legacy Report did highlight uh, difficulties around the lateness of papers from the department delays that we, there was in receiving uh, briefings and delays in responding to committee requests for information. And um, it was suggested in that re legacy report that that had an impact on the committee's uh, scrutiny. So um, we would sort of hope that that's not going to be an issue as we are in a, a, a new approach, new approach <coughs> as part of our uh, new ways of working. So we will sincerely hope that that is um, not going to be an issue, but we do have um, David Sterling coming to us today, and also um, next week we have the first um, deputy first minister coming along to meet the committee. Um, I'm sure that we can highlight it in the spirit of a new approach. We can certainly highlight that we hope that we won't be encountering any such difficulties moving forward, and that we can get all of the relevant papers that we need um, in order to uh, conduct the work of the committee. Um, I had an opportunity yesterday to meet uh, informally with David Sterling um, and just in advance of uh, today's meeting and I know that I had suggested that at that stage and that he was very much up for a new approach from the department but I'm sure that we can question and, and seek that assurance from him later and I know that myself and the deputy chairperson will be meeting with um, the first and deputy first minister next Tuesday in advance of the meeting next Wednesday so we'll hopefully um, wire them off at that stage that we would like to see that new approach and get that assurance and hopefully that assurance will come on Wednesday of next week as well. Is everybody happy enough with that? Okay, then we will move to looking at subordinate legislation uh, and to just check people are happy with the delegation of technical scrutiny to the examiner of statutory mm -hmm. rules. Um, so on page 58 of the meeting pack, we have the relevant paper. And um, maybe I could just ask you to note the guidance paper on handling the subordinate legislation and the statutory rules. But maybe, Marie, do you want to give us a, an update on that section? We have two statutory rules um, that will be coming to us next week. And before that, in closed session, I'll be given um, a short, short information session on how we deal with it. But the guidance and standing or handling statutory rule just covers the role of the committee, the technical examination, the merits, the policy aspects, um, reports, uh, and the different kinds of statutory rules. But it's normal practice for a committee to delegate responsibility for the technical scrutiny of the rules so that the committee then is able to focus on the policy aspects. So that's what you're looking at today and decide whether you're content to do that. Yes. Are we happy enough for that? Yeah. Okay, and again, just without this, that needs read in for the um, minutes then. So we have the agreement of members that the committee for the executive office resolves understanding order 43 to delegate to the examiner of statutory rules the technical <coughs> scrutiny of statutory rules referred to the committee under the above mentioned standing order. The committee further resolves that in carrying out this function, the examiner shall be authorised to report her technical findings on each statutory rule to the Assembly and to the relevant department, as well as to the committee itself, and to publish her report. Okay. So, item nine is the Committee for the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister Legacy Report 2011 to 2016, which is on page 62 of the meeting pack. Um, obviously, the Legacy Report sets out the activities and the outputs and the achievements of the committee during that period and highlights a range of issues um, which we may want to take into consideration um, preparing the way forward with our work plan. So I would ask maybe if members are agreeable that we note that report, but are there any 
elements of that report, although I think we've kind of had the start of that conversation. Is there any elements of that that people would like to comment on? Okay, so we'll note the report. Uh, item 10, which is the Executive Office first day brief, the oral briefing, uh, to advise members that the... Oh, just reading out that too much about you and you walked into the room. So uh, we now have the uh, Permanent Secretary, uh, Mr David Sterling, who will provide us with the overview of the Department and the Executive Office. Uh, members have been given the uh, first day brief of the Department, which gives us the structures and the background information and gives us information on the various directorates and agencies which are at page 91 of the meeting pack. So I think we'll welcome you along to the meeting. Uh, David, thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, short enough notice and asking you to come up and meet with us and we appreciate that. Um, we're looking forward to working with yourself and your uh, senior directors and officers and look forward to doing so in a way that allows us to work well together. We will, obviously, as a committee, be scrutinising the work of your department, but I know that we will do that in a courteous and um, open way that allows us all to work together and provide certain amounts of support for each other in our work, but also just to have that sort of critical friend role as well. I think what we'll do for the format for um, the meeting today, if you're happy, is that we will let you give us a presentation just on the department, on the sort of layout of the department, the structures, some of the key officers and some of the issues that are there. And then we'll progress after that, maybe just asking you a few easy questions about uh, the work that's ongoing at the minute. So if you're happy enough, we'll pass over to yourself. OK. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it, it is good to be back. Uh, I was actually checking my records, and this is my first attendance at an Assembly Committee since uh, I attended the Finance Committee on the 16th of January 2017. So um, great to be back here. Uh, and I had actually I'd forgotten that little sort of free zone of excitement that you get as you're waiting in the corridor outside to come into a committee. So. Uh, um, Thank you for your sort of kind words there, um, and I, I would share the general sentiment that you expressed about the way in which uh, you look forward to us working together. Uh, I'm certainly keen to establish uh, good relationships, um, a good productive working relationship with the committee. Um, the uh, New Deal, New Approach, um, uh, sorry, New Decade, New Approach document sets out a very ambitious programme. Um, all designed to make this a better place. Uh, there will be no shortage of challenges, um, budget and Brexit issues, just to name but two. Um, but uh, I can assure you there's a real desire uh, in departments um, to get cracking on this, uh, to working with you. Um, and we recognise absolutely that you have a very important scrutiny role. Um, but you also have an advisory role as well, and uh, you know, we will certainly be looking to you for advice uh, in facing up to many of the challenges ahead. And like we very clearly do have a strong mutual interest in working together to make people's lives better. So um, I hope this is the beginning of a good relationship. Um, uh, I'm, I'm probably, uh, to give you a sort of broad overview of the department, um, it might be easiest just to look at the organisation chart for the department, um, if, if people have that. I'm sorry, I don't know the age numbering in your packs, but I think there is one there. Page 95. Yeah. Um, and uh, I realise this is probably slightly small print, but I'll just give a, a sort of headline overview, and then probably it might be more productive just to take questions from there on. Uh, I'll start on the left, and obviously we, um, we, we, we look after, um, but do not, uh, if, if you like, manage the Office of the Legislative Council, but it's simply to acknowledge that they need somewhere within the departmental structure for sort of pay and rations purposes. Uh, and Brenda King, as the uh, uh, Legislative Council, will be well known to you all. Um, uh, I, I will mention in passing that um, we obviously have a commitment within the New Decade, New Approach document to bring a legislative programme to the Assembly by the 11th of February. Um, and it is likely that there will probably be around 11 bills 
uh, to be brought to the Assembly um, before the summer. Um, and they will uh, comprise a number of things, um, things that are urgently needed, things that are ready. Um, there will be some uh, bills which will address some of the issues in the uh, NDNA document. Um, but certainly the, the, the desire is to ensure that the Assembly has a full legislative programme uh, throughout this mandate. And, and I think given that um, there is a bit of a backlog, that, that will be certainly the case. Uh, if we move across then, um, uh, we have the International Relations Group, which uh, is led by uh, Andrew McCormick, who uh, is Director General International Relations. Uh, Director General is equivalent to Permanent Secretary in terms of grade. Uh, and his director is Karen Pearson. And um, they have a major interest, obviously, in, uh, um, uh, in the Brexit agenda. And their role is to coordinate policy development across all departments, coordinate the response of the Northern Ireland Executive to Brexit on Brexit issues. Uh, and that is going to be a very major endeavour for us over the next while, and we may want to get into exploring that uh, during this session. Um, the International Relations Group also looks after our three overseas offices, obviously uh, Brussels, Washington and Beijing. Um, uh, we, the UK leaves the EU on Friday. Um, our office in Brussels will no longer be, um, uh, it'll no longer have the status that it previously had, but I think our view would be it will still be very important that Northern Ireland um, has a presence in Brussels. Uh, again, um, given the nature of the Ireland, Northern Ireland protocol. Um, we will still have a keen interest in regulations that uh, come from Brussels, certainly for the next four years. Um, the Washington office, uh, again, is uh, it's uh, recently been taken over by um, Andrew Elliott, who's moved from Brussels, and um, Andrew has replaced uh, uh, Norman Houston, who you will all know, and who has been uh, a great servant uh, in Washington for many, many years. Um, uh, Tim Lusty um, is out in Beijing, and we were in touch with Tim today just to check how he is, given the um, issue around the coronavirus. So he, he is he is fine, but um, uh, a big job just being uh, out in Beijing. And um, Tim will be moving, coming back here, and cur we're currently in the process of identifying a successor for Tim out there. Um, again, the International Relations Group also looks after the North-South Ministerial Council, and again, um, there will clearly be a desire to get a, an NSMC meeting up uh, and running, and also uh, British-Irish Council meetings as well. Um, if we move then across further, then uh, we have Chris Stewart heading up the Programme for Government and Executive Support uh, Directorate. And um, uh, Chris has a, a variety of responsibilities. Uh, he obviously heads up the program for government team. Uh, and again, um, a lot of work will need to be done to uh, translate the various commitments that are contained within the NDNA document into the next program for government. And obviously, we will be um, we're, we, we're uh, proposing a process for creating the next program for government. Uh, for the next period, uh, that, that is, is, is currently with ministers, and um, again, there'll be a big piece of work to be done to create a uh, longer-term programme for government with an accompanying multi-year budget to take us through the next few years, uh, and in a way that um, is designed to promote well-being for everybody. Um, so, big, big piece of work there. Uh, obviously, Chris oversees the operation of various um, support units which provide support to the First Minister, Deputy First Minister, um, coordinates uh, work within the department uh, and then also provides a bridge between the Executive and the Assembly. So there's a, a lot done between um, the staff in that area and Assembly staff just to make sure that uh, that relationship works well. Um, if we move across then to uh, the Strategic Policy Equality and Good Relations Directorate, which is headed up by Mark Brown, 
uh, and Mark has a, a variety of um, responsibilities. Uh, equality, victims, human rights and delivering social change. Um, quite a big agenda on delivering social change, but that directorate, which is headed up by Gareth Johnson, also looks after um, the uh, outworkings of the Historical Institutional Abuse Inquiry report. And again, we're uh, pleased that, that legislation is now in place and the redress arrangements are be, being, uh, being established. Um, and uh, hopefully the redress arrangements should be such that uh, redress payments can begin April May time onwards. Uh, you maybe want to pick up on that. Alongside that, obviously, there's a commitment to put in place um, uh, payments for victims, the victims' pension issue. And again, a very uh, demanding timetable there, um, which would require that um, uh, those payments can begin from May this year. Um, the urban villages, uh, race equality and uh, communities and transition uh, directorate, again, uh, busy directorate, quite a broad agenda there. Um, uh, similarly, good relations and together building united communities, again, quite a broad range of responsibilities uh, and the detail, I think, is set out in the, the first day brief. Uh, the infrastructure directorate, which obviously would uh, look after, for example, um, our interests in Ebrington and Mays Long Cash, again, um, quite a significant set of um, responsibilities there. And then the last directorate would be um, the Finance and Corporate Services Directorate. So that's a sort of brief overview of the structure of the department. Um, I realise I've covered a lot of ground. I also recognise that I think the committee will be getting presentations from all the people I've mentioned there over the next number of weeks. And certainly the intention would be to make sure that you have as full an understanding as possible and as quickly as possible about the work of the department. Okay, David, thank you very much for giving us that um, overview. And I suppose it's maybe a slightly more difficult department to explain if it was health or education. It's fairly obvious maybe some of the work that follows on from it. But with the executive office, there are many different elements that are in completely different lines from each other. Um, I have a couple of questions myself, and then we'll, um, we'll branch out and get um, members' questions as well. Um, if I could just pick up on the bit that you had mentioned about the payments for the historical institutional abuse, um, and, and I know that you've said there that you hope that you'll get the payments by April, May time. Now, in the January monitoring round, there was some funding that was given by the finance minister, and it was referring more to scoping exercises as opposed to which sort of when you hear scoping exercise, it sounds very much at the beginning of a process rather than being very near the conclusion. And I suppose we've, um, you know, probably let these um, victims down by not getting a very quick conclusion and swift conclusion and moving to the payments in this issue. So if you could provide us maybe with just a bit more information about that, that could be a bit more concrete, that we can provide that assurance that, that individuals would, would need. <clears throat> yeah, of course. Um, going back three years um, or so, I think one of the things we recognised very early on, uh, one of the areas where um, the absence of the Assembly and the Exec was going to be most keenly felt was in this particular area. And without going over all the history, um, I nonetheless concluded that uh, dealing with the issues affecting the victims and survivor had to be a top priority for the department. Um, so in a rather unusual way, we, um, we agreed that we would construct draft legislation, consult on that, involve the groups, and if there's no assembly in place, we would press the Secretary of State to put that legislation in place through Westminster. And again, without going through all the history, um, that was uh, achieved. And I think it was the 7th of November that the legislation actually um, completed its passage through Westminster. And since then, we've been working very hard with the victims and survivors to put all the uh, various arrangements, processes and structures in place to allow redress payments to flow as quickly as possible. And that has included the appointment of a president of the redress board and two supporting members who would be non-judicial figures. So the first redress board is essentially in place. 
Um, there are rules which uh, the redress board will need to adopt, which are reaching conclusion. Uh, there is also an application process which will need to be uh, uh, constructed, and we give a very strong commitment to the victors, victims and survivors that they would be fully involved in the design of that process, and that is ongoing at the moment. So the intention is that the uh, application process will be open by the end of March at the latest, uh, and that the redress, uh, uh, first redress panel uh, will be in place in April to begin to consider this. So um, that is important. Uh, alongside that, we need to put in place a commissioner for survivors of institutional child abuse. That process begins shortly, but in the meantime, we have an interim advocate for victims and survivors in Brandon McAllister, whose role will continue into, until the commissioner is appointed. We also recognise that um, victims and survivors uh, may be located all around the world. So we'll be developing a very comprehensive communication campaign. It'll be a global campaign designed to uh, make sure that everybody who may have been affected knows about this and knows about how to apply for redress. Uh, and that will uh, kick off alongside the opening of applications. Um, so this is, a, this is a very major challenge, very major task. There will need to be more than one redress panel. And again, it'll be for the president to determine exactly how many will need to be put in place. But again, we're putting in place uh, procedures to allow those to be constructed as quickly as possible. Uh, and obviously, we're grateful to the Lord Chief Justice for having appointed the president. And he will also be appointing further judicial figures to work on each of the further redress panels. So um, a considerable amount of work uh, is, is, has been needed and it is being done. And you know, I have said that we need to do this at the fastest pace possible that avoids any risk of things not being done properly. And I think that is where we are at the moment. OK, well, certainly that imperative and that speed would be welcome. I, I think this is going to be an issue that the committee is likely to take um, some tracking of to make sure that we can hold you to those time skills that you have mentioned and we can sort of revisit that as we go on. But um, thank you for the, the answer to that. Um, if I can move on then maybe just to the, the Brexit um, side of things, which is obviously something that uh, is within the, the department. And um, there is the suggestion of the establishment of a Brexit subcommittee. Um, and I know that today um, I met with some members of various organisations, headquarter organisations such as Manufacturing NI and the Ulster Farmers Union and um, you know, other organisations which have really taken a step forward in the last couple of years and, and have been um, sort of carrying out a lot of, of the advocacy work. Um, if we are going to establish the Brexit subcommittee, if, could, could you give us some time scale as to when that might happen? And also, do you think that that would be something that in some way could be open to some of those um, individuals that have set up excellent networks and have had good working relations um, with various parts of government, both here, Dublin, London, uh, and in Brussels, uh, so that we don't just suddenly cut off some supply and move forward? Is that something that could be involved there? Um, I, I'm expecting the Brexit subcommittee to meet quite soon. I can't give you a precise date, but uh, I think there's a, a clear desire by all ministers to get this up and running quickly, and they recognise the significance of the issue. Um, I, 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 I can't sort of preempt what way the committee will want to operate, but I think there's no doubt. Um, yeah, you know, the the business community has been quite active in this area, and. I am pretty sure ministers will want to take the views of all stakeholders with a keen interest in, uh, uh, in Brexit. And um, uh, you know, as I say, I, I'd be surprised if, if there wasn't opportunities for stakeholders to <coughs> present to ministers and to the committee. Okay. And my final just remarks will be about um, the creation of the Bill of Rights. Um, it's it's referenced that it would be within 30 days of the restoration of devolution. So I think we're at day 16, 17 or 18 at this stage, so has there been plans put in place for that, uh, for that committee and the terms of reference for that committee to be developed? We're looking at a whole range of commitments. Um, there's some very challenging uh, timescales and deadlines set out on that. 
uh, I wouldn't want to give a guarantee that everything will be met exactly in line with the timetable set out in the NDNA document, but people are working hard to, to progress everything. Sounds like it's not going to be done in the 30 days. Well, I, I, I'm, not, is, I'm not saying whether it will or will or it won't, but there, there are like, some incredibly demanding things in there. Um, there's no doubt about that. Mike. Chair, thank you. David, you're very welcome. Um, I think the fact you're here uh, for our first meeting and the, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister are scheduled for next week uh, is very encouraging. Uh, I'm also encouraged by the fact you're saying you'll be looking to this committee for advice. Um, because I think there were members of the Legacy Committee who didn't feel that the relationship was perhaps as good as it could be, particularly in terms of the information flow. So what I would like to think this committee will do is be sympathetic to the fact that because it's a joint office, decisions are sometimes going to take longer than a single ministry, um, and therefore the information flow can get, can get backlogged. But in, in return for that, I suppose the trade I would be looking for is not to leave us feeling that that's being used as an excuse uh, to withhold information. Uh, but overall, positive. Two questions, if I may, on two appointments. The first, Kosica, the Commissioner, with regard to institutional abuse. Uh, what's the process and the timeline? The, um, the advert for that should go out very shortly. Um, like it, it's a, a matter of days, um, I'm expecting, and it's a, it'll be run in accordance with public appointments procedures, so... Competence-based? Uh, uh, yes, I believe so. Um, uh, we'll be moving that on as quickly as we can, but it will take some weeks to, to complete that. And at the completion of that, will there be a list of, of persons deemed appointable, and then it will be a final decision for FM and DFM, or will there be an appointee? Um, I can't recall exactly the detail of how the final appointment will be made, but I can, I can check that and get back to you. And the second appointment, if uh, you don't mind, is Head of the Civil Service, because you have indicated that you're going to open uh, a new chapter this year. So can you tell us the process and the timeline for your successor? Um, I can't tell you the timeline, but what I can tell you is that the, the process will be uh, one that will obviously need to be agreed by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. Uh, and um, uh, that, I think discussions around that are to begin shortly. Um, and uh, we haven't got an agreed timeline on that as yet. But you're stepping down in August? I've indicated that I, my, I plan to go at the end of August, yes. So I would suggest there's some urgency to getting a process underway? Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, and at the end of the day with that process it will be for the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister to confirm the appointment of your successor? Indeed. It will be run in accordance with um, Civil Service Commissioner's guide guidelines but obviously the First Minister and Deputy First Minister will have a role in that process as they <coughs> did in the process that led to my appointment. Again, will they be given a name to endorse or will they be given a list of people who are deemed appointable? The, the process hasn't been agreed as yet, so um, I, I wouldn't want to comment on exactly how that will uh, happen. Am I right in thinking that for the head of the civil service UK-wide, the Prime Minister, uh, has a list of deemed appointables? Uh, again, I am not privy to the exact detail. I know that the appointments of permanent secretaries and the Cabinet Secretary are done on a different basis to that which applies here. And again, the Prime Minister has a role in those appointments, which may be different to the role that the first Deputy First Minister have here. But as I say, I wouldn't want to be too definitive about those differences. Not, not least because the process for uh, agreeing the appointment of my successor has not been settled as yet. Will you have an input to that, or do you have an opinion that you'd share on why we do that? Um, uh, it will be led by um, the Department of Finance, the HDR Department. I, I will probably have an input to that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Christopher? Thank you, Chairman. And some of the questions that I had intended to ask have been asked, but one of the things that's contained within the new DEA approach, and it was one of the things that actually during the talks, something that was very close to my heart, uh, there's a review of arm's length bodies has been committed to in that and the words around that are very important. The words are with a view to rationalisation. And I'm just wondering 
in the long years that you've been involved, David, I think almost every agreement has had a commitment to a review of arm's length bodies contained within it. And in that time, the number of arm's length bodies, I have no doubt, has become bigger. Um, I'm just wondering, how would you envisage that impacting upon the Executive Office, that review? And do you see scope for slimming down government mergers of existing arm's length bodies that fall under the remit of the Executive Office or abolition of arm's length bodies altogether? Um, it, you're right, it, it is it's clearly a commitment. Mm -hmm. uh, I was there when the commitment was suggested. Um, uh, and you're right, I have been involved before on occasions when um, there have been reviews of arm's length bodies. I think the starting point this time will be to look at what was done before. There was quite a comprehensive exercise carried out, I can't remember exactly when, but it will be probably five, six, seven years ago. Uh, and that didn't lead to the um, abolition of, of many ALBs. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I think we will need to look again uh, at this. Uh, we'll need to do so with some very clear objectives in mind. Mm -hmm. You know, is it to streamline government? Uh, is it to reduce cost? Uh, is it to improve the delivery of outcomes? You know, those things may not necessarily be in conflict, but they could be. Mm. Um, so I think uh, before that is, uh, you know, this is being looked at, but again, uh, precise I, objectives have not yet been agreed. I, I mean, I have a question into the Finance Minister in terms of time frames of any review being published. Do you have a time frame in mind? Uh, not at the moment, no. What I would say is that uh, the previous piece of work was quite substantial. Uh, it will require quite a substantial piece of work again. And in fairness to colleagues in the Department of Finance, they have quite a big set of commitments, uh, not least uh, in developing a budget for next year and indeed for beyond. So um, I, I'm not sure exactly where we will be in terms of a timetable for the arm's length body review, but it is something that's being looked at. Okay. Um, just in terms of our international relations and one of the issues that are one of the areas where um, you mentioned we have the, the office in DC, the office in um, China and the office in uh, Brussels. How is the effectiveness of those offices scored? By what matrices do we judge, yeah, that they're doing well or try to identify potential new places where we might be wanting to go? It's a good question. and. Um we don't have a set of KPIs for the offices to say, well, you hit this target, but you didn't hit that target, so you're doing well and you're not doing well. Um, I think this is something that does need to be looked at. And uh, the, uh, I think the executive, uh, I think there's a draft international strategy, okay. international relations strategy. I think if you're going to start to make judgments about the effectiveness of the overseas offices. I think you would need to do the, that on the basis of an agreed international strategy. Yeah. In other words, where you have a clear understanding of what it what is you, you want. want from your offices overseas. Mm -hmm. And so this is simply a personal view, that, but given, uh, given global developments over the last three years, including Brexit, uh, I think it would be timely to review the international relations strategy. Um, and to look at the disposition of not just the three executive offices, but you know the Invest NI offices overseas, just to make sure that um, they are uh, delivering maximum benefit. Yes, with a view to, I mean, I, I'm not suggesting for a second that the three offices that we presently operate should cease to exist. I'm suggesting perhaps in the context of a, an international relations strategy that has a sort of global outlook, you know, potential emerging markets, places like India, um, is somewhere where perhaps we need to be. Is, is that Indeed, no. Those are um, those, those are entirely legitimate questions. Um, and I, I should say, um, uh, I think the three offices overseas, given their relatively small size, mm. do punch well, well above their weight. Yeah. Uh, I think we get great service and great access for them in all three areas. Uh, and indeed, um, there may well be an argument that indeed post Brexit, um, they need more resource. They may need more resource. Yep. Okay, and Pat. 
Thanks, Chair. <coughs> Thanks for your overview, David. Um, most of the issues I want to deal with have already been touched on one way or another. I just want to drill into them a little bit. In terms of the uh, Brexit subcommittee, uh, my understanding is that all the parties representative in the, in the executive have agreed to go on that subcommittee. That's right, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. That's fair enough. Uh, and in terms of uh, the time scales for legislation uh, and well, first of all, I suppose the legislation itself, never mind the time scales and the various strategies that have been committed to in the, in the New Deal, um, have you decided yet where all of those issues are going to sit in the various departments? Uh, no, um, that's, uh, that's work that's still to be done. And obviously there need to be uh, work done between um, officials, ministers, advisors, across all departments. So um, there's a piece of work being done just to identify um, all the various commitments. And I suppose the next series stage really will be to sit down and work together just to identify who is going to do what. Uh, I think this will need to be done in conjunction with uh, the planning for the next programme for government and the development of the budget, just so that we have an understanding of what is going to be deliverable. Um, there are obviously some things that have specific time frames set beside them but there are other commitments which don't so uh, there, there's going to need to be quite a lot of programming done just to identify what is going to be achievable given the resources available etc and when do you expect that piece of work to be finalized um well it, I know ministers will want it done as quickly as possible and uh, there is ongoing engagement uh, with ministers in the executive looking at this. Um, we were away last Wednesday and further sessions involving all ministers are being planned as well. So give me a ballpark figure then when uh, you can't uh, really I, I can't give you, I, I couldn't give you a date when it'll all be concluded, but um, uh, obviously um, there are certain things that will drive this. Like for example, um, uh, we will need, departments will need a budget for the next financial year beginning in April um, and the work that will be done thereafter to develop a longer term programme for government uh, will need to kick off in earnest as well. So um, I think we're, we're, we're talking within that sort of time frame. Um, I think ministers will be keen to agree the highest priority uh, items that need to move ahead quickly, and some of those are identified in the NDNA document. I say the more difficult thing will be to identify things that maybe um, haven't got a time frame attached to them and are going to need some more consideration given those resource considerations. So are you saying where there are time scales, particularly in regard to legislation, that it has been decided where they are going to sit? Uh, certainly my expectation is that where there are uh, clear time frames for the delivery of legislation, then yes, th those will be, you know, ev every effort will be made to make sure those are met. But is there agreement yet on what departments they're going into? Uh, not, no, not yet. Not, not exactly. No. So, you know, if there isn't agreement yet, uh, we can expect these time frames to slip. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily say that. It, it may be quite easy to agree uh, where certain things sit. It's just to say we haven't sat down and determined that. But you know, I wouldn't want anything I've said to suggest that uh, time frames that are set out here won't be met. I'm just saying there are a lot of them um, there, and we just need to make sure we have a program which will allow. Uh, everything to be delivered in line with the time frame set out. Okay. Uh, so just uh, drilling down specifically into one issue in terms of the Irish language legislation, and there's a commitment uh, in the NDNA that draft legislation would be in front of the Assembly within three months. Uh, w what's your view on that? Is that, uh, is that a runner? Well, I have no reason to believe that timetable won't be met. Right, and what's the process in terms of appointment of uh, an Irish language commissioner, a Ulster Scots commissioner? What's the process for that? Uh, again, um, officials in the department are looking at that now. There's, again, there's quite a big programme of work to be done there. Um, we're going to have to create a new 
uh, unit to look after that, and that's being looked at at the moment. We're trying to pull together staff from various places to create that unit, so it's being actively looked at now. And what's the time frame on that? Um, uh, the time frame in terms of the completion of the unit that's going to manage this piece of work is really days. We're trying to pull <coughs> together a, a team uh, as we speak, uh, and after that then obviously um, the uh, the aim will be to make sure that those time targets that are that you mentioned are met. Okay. But certainly, I'm under. You know, I've got a very clear uh, understanding that we will have to do all we can to make sure that they are met, and I've no reason to believe they won't be. Okay. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you, uh, George. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. And just to welcome David to the committee. Um, in relation to the Ebrington project, just wondering where where we're at with that because. Uh, it's in my neck of the woods, obviously. Sure. And, um, pass by it quite often. There's quite a lot of work still going on there. Just wondering, what role has the department still in that project? Um, there have been there's been quite a lot of progress in recent times, and uh, that was I'm sorry that was one of the issues that I meant to check today. Exactly where we are today. I will make sure that I will, them, George. Yeah, I, I will make sure that you get the up-to-date position. But certainly, I think um, uh, good progress has been made, and I just I can't remember exactly what stage we're at there. So apologies for that. No problem, David. That's fine. Thank you. Chair, and this just goes back uh, to uh, what Christopher had spoke about earlier on in arms length bodies. He said that. There has been a substantial amount of work that has taken place, and it, but it will require substantially more work. Uh, the thing that usually says to me that uh, it, it's been kicked down the road a bit, and I think it's, uh, there's two years left in this mandate. Will we be in a position to be able to tackle and deal uh, with uh, some of the concerns that people have regarding arms and like valleys, given that it's been a feature at, at, uh, in this assembly for many, many years? Look, no, look, um, we will give it. Um there's a clear desire for the review to take place. Um, it will be done, but I'm just saying it'll need to be prioritised along with all the other things. Uh, and again, uh, there was a very, very strong desire the last time to reduce the number of ALBs, and for a variety of reasons, that didn't happen. So I don't want that to suggest that we're going into this with a mindset that we cannot find <coughs> major change, but I just think we need to be realistic that this proved difficult before, uh, and it may prove difficult again. Thank you. Trevor. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you, David. Um, I, I noticed how you've chosen your words very carefully today, and I suppose it's your it's our first day and it's your first day. But you have noticed in terms you have said in terms of priorities that given the position we're in, these are prioritising. And I think it's been been vital. For some people, some things are more important, and for some others less important, but obviously up there for most people will be health and education. But given the, um, what we've heard in terms of the British government in relation to the financial package, how confident are you everything will be delivered? How confident are you that the, uh, how confident are you that the British government will cough up more money to deliver some of these things? <coughs> yeah, time to choose your words carefully. Um, <laughs> look, the, the finance minister has, has made it clear that he does not believe that the uh, financial resources that have been provided will be sufficient to deliver all the commitments in the NDNA document. Uh, and, you know, I think that's something that um, is, is now sort of widely recognised. So that, that's why I say <coughs> I have been careful with my choice of words. Um, as to whether there is likely to be any more money. Um, obviously, you will know the Finance Minister had meetings uh, in London um, last week. Um, uh, he, I think, was quite positive about um, how they went. Uh, and, it, and again, uh, it's a matter of record that the Department of Finance is doing further work to identify the uh, cost of the various commitments, the challenges um, that are facing us, and uh, to go back to Treasury with a strong case for additional resources. I wouldn't want to make a judgment on the likelihood of uh, that leading to significantly more money, but which we all leads, hope it will. Yeah. Which leads me then to the question, given that we have got 
a list of strong, very strong commitments. Some of those who will address lots of people within the community, whether that be through health or education. How then are your department going to draw up which ones are those the biggest priorities um, with the limited resources we have? Well, this is one of the really good reasons why I'm You're delighted retired. to see ministers back. <laughs> yeah, there, there, will, there will need, yeah, and that as well, um, there will need to be uh, political discussions about priorities. Uh, I have no doubt about that. Fair enough. Okay. Um, David, you'll be pleased to know that that's, that's the end of the, the questioning from members. That's probably an indication of the reduced number of members on committees makes these things go a bit quicker. Um, <coughs> I hope that your um, sense of nerves outside the door were worth it coming in. But I would like to thank you for coming along. Probably at this stage, I'm far too late to um, the note that was to point out that this has been recorded by Hansard. So, um, but maybe just update you that that was happening. I should have mentioned that at the beginning. I, I had a but, conversation with uh, a <laughs> Hansard but, person outside. Yeah. So. Oh, good. Well, th thank you very much for coming along. We appreciate that. I'm sure we'll be seeing you again. Uh, and hopefully that we can get updates on some of the things that we've mentioned today. And as we look at our forward work plan, wherever it does, um, sort of fit in with uh, members of staff of your department, if you could uh, encourage them all to be making themselves available to come and see us, that will help to maintain the good relations that we hope to have going forward. But thank you very much indeed. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. <coughs> okay. okay, members, thank you for that. Um, we'll move on to just a couple of final items then. Um, just if I could ask members if you're content, there is a forward work plan, the um, draft forward work plan from page 160 that looks at a number of weeks going ahead and has drafted in some of the people that we would consider asking to come along and meet with ourselves. Um, <coughs> many of them are members of the Executive Office Department and I suppose maybe just to request from yourself if you're happy there was information within the um, first day brief that was there but maybe that we would ask for some written uh, information from those individuals to give us something to reflect on before they actually come in to meet with themselves so if members are happy with that we'll request those and um, also that there will be a departmental budget um, and the finance minister indicated on Monday past that he intends to bring the budget bill before the House in February. So at some point, either sort of two weeks or three weeks down the line, there should be um, some form of uh, departmental budget for us to examine. And we will slot that in whenever that information is made available to us as well. And um, that we have uh, requested from the department that they will have various consultations, legislative program, uh, business plans, policy reviews and other uh, bits and pieces of information that they will be sending up to us and that we have asked them uh, to make that available to us as soon as they have it so that we can get it factored into each one of the meetings and the relevant meetings to be able to give it consideration. Yeah, Chair, just to go back to institutional abuse and then bearing in mind Trevor's legitimate concerns about bringing in victims um, <clears throat> and perhaps falsely raising hope. Um, what about at an early opportunity bringing in Gareth Johnson, who's the legal official in TO in the Executive Office, and Brendan McAllister, uh, the interim advocate, so that we have an evidence base yeah. to consider how we take our next steps, which I would hope might include inviting victims groups uh, to tell us their experience, but at least we're testing it against the evidence of the officials who are leading on this. On this. Can I get getting a sense from people yeah, in the room? Can yeah, I suggest if we, if we do have um, the first and deputy first minister next week, we'll see if we can get that scheduled for the week after. Yeah. That it's something that we're looking at very urgently and, and immediately. If members are happy, yeah. um, and um, then just maybe beyond the, that, uh, having heard the presentation from David, are there any other areas that people feel they would like to get some sort of presentation on that goes beyond what's in the information presented? Are people happy with that draft forward work plan there for the next number of weeks? weeks and give us, yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> then there's just item number 12 um, is correspondence, which there is none. Uh, chairperson's business, I've already uh, included those in other parts of the uh, meetings, so there's none there. Um, just to ask, is there any other business that members have? Just to congratulate you, Mr. Chairman, on your appointment, you. and to say I'm sure all members of the committee look forward to working with you. Thank you. We're being very good to each other. Well, you were very kind to me much, on yeah. Monday. Congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate so I had that. Return it's appreciated. It's appreciated. <laughs> 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 okay. Um,